Welcome everyone to the first ever N64 Brew Game Jam. For two months, our participants were required to make a game designed to run on official Nintendo 64 hardware. It's a pretty challenging task, considering it's been almost 25 years since the console debuted on store shelves. And, well, original development hardware is considered to be more valuable than gold. To us, at least. The game's submissions are all in, and they're currently being reviewed by our panel of judges. However, considering that the game had to be designed with a theme in mind, we thought it'd be best to give our participants a chance to talk about their projects and how they interpreted the theme, size. Before we start, judges, please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm David Doak. Um, I worked at Rare in the 90s on Goldeneye uh, on the N64 and on Perfect Dark. Um, a great time working at Rare, which was kind of you know, one of one of the big I guess one of the big drivers of the N64 content uh, for Nintendo, and um, I mean, you know, to this day, it remains one of my favorite consoles. I, I just, you know, it always, always puts a smile on my face just plug, plugging it in, slamming in a few controllers, and and, and, and punching a car in. So I'm really, really glad to be part of this, and great to see some N64 devs still going on. Uh, hello, I'm Alan Finlay, and um, I did. I worked on the sound tools for the N64. That was direct from Nintendo. Um, and that was partly because Software Creations had done the SNES sound tools for uh, Nintendo as well. They reverse engineered the audio hardware. Um, and I ended up doing the N64 sound tools, as well as then moving on to some other N64 games. Um, nothing that really stands out. Other than Carmageddon, that's one of the worst N64 games. Um, and I've carried on with games since, really. Hi, everybody. Neil Voss, um, the guy who makes electronic music mostly for games with Tetris in their title. Um, loved being part of what happened with N64 back in the day. I feel like the 90s was, in many ways, a golden era for gaming and for kind of new horizons like. 3D games and 3D worlds and nascent forms of virtual reality and things like that that we're still coming back to to this day. And so a really super exciting time to uh, to be there. And it's really cool to see how like the lineage of all that continues on and the people still like seek to make fun and cool and compelling hacks and things with game consoles. I mean, I've, I've kind of been in and out of the 8-bit and chiptune scenes, especially around New York, and I've always loved what what everybody's doing and the energy that the kind of homebrew community brings. So excited, was excited to play these games, loved it, and looking forward to meeting you all. Hey, this is Snoop Blacks here. I'm a Nintendo 64 content creator. I like making ROM hacks of like custom Super Smash Brothers stages or custom Banjo-Kazooie levels. I mainly just really love Nintendo 64. It's a console I grew up with. And this Nintendo 64 game jam has just been great. Just so many Great entries and so fun to be playing these brand new Nintendo 64 experiences. All right, and last but not least, I am Lorenzo, or you might know me as Boo342342. You can call me however you want. I'm a programming student and I'm moderator at N64 Brew. Uh, all I really have to talk about is I make like games, some mods. Just check out my GitHub, I put everything there because I love my open source. All right, so before we get started with our participant interviews, all of our judges have some sort of history with the console, either as developers or players or both. I'd like to use this opportunity to ask everyone a question relating to their experience with the system. Dr. Doak, Goldeneye is a pretty unique shooter, helped by the fact that its development team was inexperienced with game development at the time. My question is, what sort of things did your team do which you worked well for Goldeneye and Perfect Dark, but you would avoid doing in your later work, such as time splitters? I I, I really think, I mean, what what the Goldeneye team and Perfect Dark team did really became a model for what we how we planned our developments going forward on, on, on time splitters. And um, there weren't I don't think there were things that we avoided doing that we had done. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we tried to keep alive. You, you, you mentioned the inexperience of the team when we created Goldeneye. Um, I think we always had a very open mind and and a lot of ambition for what we we wanted to do. So, I mean, 
certainly in the golden eye days one of the things i loved was you could come in in the morning with you know the size of team we had which was about eight people and 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 have had an idea overnight or anyone could have had an idea overnight and we would you know maybe we didn't formally have any kind of scrum in the morning but we would just be talking over over a cup of tea and stuff and we would just try and do something during the day so you know we we, we had we had a wonderful agility um which I think you know is something that you see nowadays in game jams and in indie dev. And one of the things we did do on Goldmine, which was definitely a bad, <laughs> a bad thing, is that up until fairly late in the development, there was no source control at all. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, I, I did a little bit of coding on it. The main coding was done by Mark Edmonds and 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 Martin Hollis, and they used to manually merge. Um, branches which would take weeks to do so um you know that was one thing that was it kind of it was also it's kind of indicative of of the kind of days that we were in it was you know there, there wasn't there wasn't a body of accepted work for games development and there, there weren't a bunch of working practices you kind of just just rolled with things um so yeah i mean i i i don't think there's anything we, we particularly did badly i guess i guess one thing Another thing, if if I had to put a finger on it, was it really took us by surprise toward the end of the game that we had to put a front end and menus on it. So that's you know that's the, <laughs> certainly when I'm when I'm when I'm like teaching or helping people with game jams, I always say it's like you know try try and get some kind of wrapper around your game um, as soon as possible um, because certainly on 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 Gold Night a lot of that stuff. The, you know the front men, front end with the dossiers and the character selection stuff. We 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 made that up at the very end. We almost like forgot we needed to do it. Um, but yep. Finley, you have quite the extensive portfolio when it comes to N64 development, having helped the developers in some form or another in all sorts of different games. Not only that, but you've also written uh, you've also written development tools for the N64, notably the sound tools. This means that you have got your hands dirty in all sorts of parts of the console. My question for you is, what sort of aspect of the system or the games that you worked on, like maybe the physics engines or the audio interface, uh, which one of these do you have the most fond memories of working on? Or maybe the most frustrating, most enjoyable, you know, interesting stories to tell? Um, I, I was originally not a games programmer, I was just general program. When I left university, I did an uh, electronics degree, but I've never really used the electronics side of it. Um, I was always really a programmer. I was interested in electronics, but ended up going down a programmer path. And I did non-games for a good few years um, after university. And then I, I was always interested. I always liked games. I always wanted to play games. And I got a job in Manchester with a company called Teotex doing a Mega Drive game and I was sort of surprised that it was basically just programming. I'd always had in my head that it was something special, if you know what I mean, um, but it was just coding in the end and the first game I did was on Mega Drive and it was pure assembly, 68,000 assembly. And I'd all, again, I'd always been non-games and I'd used some assembly, but it was mostly C that I was used to. Um, so that was a bit of a shock, but it was still, it was still enjoyable, but um, hard work really, writing everything from scratch really, no libraries to assist and things like that. Um, and I sort of, I worked there for a few years and I was getting fed up with games and the chance for being a tools programmer came up and I went for an interview at Software Creations and when they discovered I was, I was really a C programmer, they were like, that's what we want. We want to, we need someone to do the sound tools for the N64 um, and it's probably going to be based in C rather than assembly. So um, I got a job there. and. I stayed on the tool side for a while. I did, I did the sound tools, but I also did other things like getting uh, Hexen 64. I got that working with the tool chain for the N64, and then that got passed on to another programmer to uh, finish off. 
And then I got pulled back into games because they needed a non-tools programmer to carry on with some games like uh, Wayne Gretzky's hockey on the N64 as well. So they, I ended up doing that and then got back into games again. Um, and I think probably I prefer the tool side, to be honest. It feels, it feels less frantic, I suppose. You're building um, offline tools, really, to, to, to make the process of making the games easier. And for me, I think it's probably that side of it that I prefer. Uh, although, saying that, I'm, I'm fully on games again, and I have been for quite a few years. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Voss, your electronic music is hardcore, and your work on Tetrisphere earned you an award for best soundtrack in Nintendo Power. Tetrisphere's music was powered by an in-house audio driver because you felt that the tools that you were originally given were a bit too restrictive. Regardless, considering how tight everything on the N64 is to begin with, I'm sure there were a few compromises that had to be made. Was there anything that you wanted to do, like maybe unique sound or effect that you had to forego due to limitations of the audio hardware, or simply just having to balance out the amount of memory that the music takes compared to things like graphics or gameplay? No, I mean, us writing our own tools really gave me most of what at the time I, I felt was pretty expansive. I've been working on Amiga and other platforms that had way more kind of hardware audio restrictions. I was pretty excited to have the headroom of the N64, even though it wasn't Redbook or CD or anything like that. But um, by writing our own driver, we actually wrote it so that um, from, from a tooling perspective, I could um, program the music in Fast Tracker instead of kind of like a MIDI editor tied to a sampler and all that kind of stuff because we felt like it was an easier way to kind of balance out voice allocation manually and all this stuff. Um, but in the end, it meant we weren't able to do uh, some of the things that I would have liked to try with the DSPs uh, for some of the effects that were built into the, um, into the SDK, like flangers and stuff. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of had it wired up, but to custom effect commands within the tracker, but there was no way to really preview it when making or editing music. I'd have to kind of compile everything, run it, test it, and then hear the effects. So it really wasn't an effective workflow and you know something I never got to do for Tetrasphere. Um, the big thing that I think that I would have loved to have been able to do that we couldn't on either title, uh, Tetrasphere or New Tetris, was I wanted to make the music dynamic and responsive to game dynamics and play. And we had some beta code to do that for New Tetris. In fact, all the music was programmed from kind of like the down tempo, half tempo stuff up to the up tempo drum and bass. But there in the end were too many bugs in the logic in our audio system to kind of, I don't know, something to the effect of monitoring the gameplay and adjusting the audio based on the, um, the player's status and the game wasn't clicking and the game had to pass lot check and get out. So Dave, the uh, programmer, I think, quickly tore out any of the stuff that was dealing with dynamic music and asked me to rewrite or resequence the music to just be linear. So it sort of goes up and down and up and down. And in doing so, I think there was a timing bug somehow somewhere in the mix introduced in the player. So I guess the big thing I would have for New Tetris was I'd hope that the music could be dynamic and it wasn't. And in the end, there's a lot of glitches, actually, which I don't think most people notice, but some of the loop timing is a bit off. And there was one particularly nasty glitch where sample resets don't happen with new nodons properly. So there are a couple of songs where the drum loops I was sort of re-triggering later into the sample, and the pointer never points back to the beginning of the sample the way it did in my actual audio editor in the game. And so you get these audio loops that are playing from kind of like the incorrect point, and they're beat loops, so things sound a little bit weird. Um, and I was working at the time freelance and kind of shipping music over the team, but I didn't actually have an SDK to test the final cartridge on or any, or the sorry, the ROM or anything like that. So it just kind of went out the way it was. I ended up buying the game at, um, I think, a Toys R Us or something like that, taking it home, firing it up, and realizing that the music was kind of broken. So it was a little bit like, oh, well, I hope nobody notices. I don't think anybody really did, but that's, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. Sure. Snooplex, you're quite the N64 enthusiast, having grown your YouTube channel over the span of two years with weekly videos doing a varied amount of content. 
I can imagine that the recent popularity of ROM hacks has given you a lot of new content, and for a system that really hasn't had a game in shelves for over 20 years. My question for you is, what sort of things do you wish that people took advantage of when it, came, when it comes to N64 games? For instance, oh, the console has a really weird Trident controller, but very few games actually leverage the different ways you can hold it. That's a great question. Um, in my opinion, well, the Nintendo 64 controller obviously has three handles, and a majority of the games just use the middle and right handle, and there's no use of the D-pad and no use of the L buttons when that could be important. For instance, if you look at a game like Majora's Mask, where you can map buttons to the C buttons, um, there's been a ROM hack recently which updates the game so you can map buttons to the D-pad also. And that makes it so much easier because you can have seven items you can choose from at any time instead of four. And it might have to do with how the developers were tasked with their original SDKs, but I always wished more games would utilize like the D-pad and L button to do extra functions that would just be make the games better in a sense. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and ping our first group, which is da, 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 it's Team uh, Virgil, who made Slobber 64. Sorry, I was, you, we were muted. Uh, yeah, we can hear you fine. OK. Uh, yeah. is, there we go. is the bell coming? Or she's with you, right? OK. Uh, Isabel's with you, right? Yep, okay. I'm here. OK. Um, so tell us uh, uh, who did what, first of all. I think that's the best thing to start with. Um, so uh, Victor has a lot of experience uh, with uh, developing N64 games. So I, I had a, a curving, a, a learning curve, um, basically learning how, what was the framework. And, um, it is very important to him that everything is open source and it's not disturbing any type of license. Um, so he introduced me to, uh, to the library and, and basically the ecosystem around uh, how to develop uh, N64 games. Um, so, but uh, of course he is like the expert in that. And he definitely took care more of the side uh, that was uh, the specific portability on the N64 console. Uh, and I work mostly on the on the motor of the game in C. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that sums it up. <laughs> awesome. Um, and tell us about how you interpreted the theme and you used it in your title. Yeah, I mean, um, on, the, on this part, I mean, pretty straightforward, uh, in our opinion, at least in our game. So yeah, we really decided to basically combine the size of the character with uh, the direction it's moving. Uh, so that was uh, our, our basic idea. And then uh, we started thinking about what, what puzzle could we make around this. Um, and so... Uh, where you have the fires, where as soon as you touch it, you die, it's pretty common. But um, I think in, in that game, the, the grid where you can fall through uh, is pretty much pretty interesting because it allows you to to force the player uh, being a certain size. Uh, so it introduced some, some nice uh, puzzle mechanics. Um, so yeah, that's really how we, how we did it, basically. When you go uh, right or up, uh, you grow in size, and you go left or down, you, you shrink. Um, Awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions to throw their way? Um, how did you guys do your rumble pack uh, functionality? I found that really cool and I was playing the game. Like every time you bump a wall, the rumble pack goes. Is that hard to implement? No, honestly, it was. I mean, this game is using Leap Dragon, uh, so it has all the primitives in, in Leap Dragon. Uh, yeah, I mean, not so much. Every time we detect some collision, um, we were setting setting some sort of like uh, basically integer uh, for how long the rumble should uh, should should rumble and uh, and decrement it every frame. So we can also control. Uh, I think when you when you get an item, it rumbles very lightly. Uh, but when you hit a, a wall, it also uh, it rumbles more. 
And uh, while we did that, we also slightly changed the the exposition of the character. So it looks like he's like a, um, yeah, he's not trembling. Yeah, 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 trembling exactly. So, and I think both of them works works fine. So even even if you don't have the rumble pack, you can still see some visual cue that something is wrong, and that's good. Um, I actually have a question. I noticed when playing that um, if some sound effect occurs, it cuts off the music. Is that a limitation yeah. of LibDragon, or is it with how you set up audio on your side? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a limitation of, of us. It was probably doable, uh, but I mean, I know I know audio is kind of hard, and I saw I saw many contestants having issue. Uh, I mean, the the main answer right now is we're using two different kind of uh, of code to put the sound. Uh, so the music, it's uh, we're using lib uh, mic mode that is pretty well um, well used in the in the with LibDragon. It comes with LibDragon. So the, the background music is using LibMic mode. But for the sound effect it's more it's more manual. Uh, it's really a raw sound file that we, we output to the audio buffer. And uh, those two are really not compatible. So when basically when the sound effect uh, starts uh, it's going to, to cut the music for those those frames. Uh, that was not the case and we would love to have uh, both at the same time but uh, in the time we had uh, we went with that. Awesome. Um, any other questions? I'll take that as a no. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Or oh, David, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's really, really charming and, and innovative in the, in, in the controls. Um, how did you go about your level design? I mean, did you, did you have the mechanic first for the scaling of the character and then just kind of play around with things? Or, or, or was it some other approach? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we we started with building all the all the game mechanics um, and uh, defining, and and we're probably going to change. Like we know the jam is finished, so we had to, we just had to make uh, something uh, you know presentable and finished for for the for the deadline. But of course, it always can be improved, and we have plenty of ideas. So we defined. Uh, a text, uh, you know, ASCII file uh, with, you know, like a, we coded more or less what everything represented. And uh, then once the mechanics were already there, uh, we, we played with that. We created a bunch of maps. Uh, the ones we, um, yeah, the ones we, we, we presented with the game are, are basically like just the, um, at the same time, the more, approachable ones and also still a little fun um the, especially the last map um but uh yeah the map creation was definitely uh a big part <laughs> of uh of the game well Once you, would, we had you all think the so yes but uh, it's we what, definitely, 20 over 20 um, years ago a little challenged and in doing, it's doing <laughs> so it's been a long time um, I, I do I remember. Think, just, yeah, I think there's a tremendous density. It's all quite low level and quite. In the, certainly in the end. Sorry, that sneezing is my problem. Yeah. as fast asleep. So, um, um, yeah, the a lot of yeah, it was all just low level ideas and and merging it together. The, the and in effect, we replicated the was, snares driver and just made it bigger and better. An and then added idea, sound tools really, on top of that um, to generate and, the sounds and underneath. Yeah, one thing to um, be to, to so yeah, I'm afraid it's, the onboarding it's so long ago. Kind of nature it's a bit vague. <laughs> I've not got the best <laughs> memory. So, yeah, I, I think it's really charming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah we 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 have played. Uh, well, we demoed all the other uh, submissions, and uh, yeah, we're we're so humbled because <laughs> there's really really good games, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's true. Like it's it's so cool to see so many people have so crazy, so much crazy ideas. Um, so yeah, no, I I agree that the gem definitely shows how people are, you know, creative and and smart. Yeah, I was quite surprised by some entries. All right, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you for answering our questions. Uh, of course. We'll call thank you. The thank next you. Thank you for everything, for organizing the jam. Uh, it was really a great, great idea.
we loved uh, we loved all of it. Uh, so thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. We'll jump to the next one. Um, Manfred. Uh, Manfred developed Castle 64. Hello. Hello. Uh, so you pretty much did everything except the sprite work on your entry, right? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Well, uh, I didn't make uh, the, the sound. It was a uh, free, uh, free music too. Okay. Um, and how did you interpret the theme uh, of the jam into your entry? Well, uh, I did interpret it uh, on the technical side. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I choose to uh, to make a game uh, with uh, the biggest size possible for uh, for the resolution. <laughs> <laughs> so I took this option. <laughs> it's it's a bad size, and uh, about the biggest size uh, possible for my sprites. Uh, well, the uh, the biggest one uh, with uh, in the menu, the main menu, uh, the big sprite. Uh, that, that that was about uh, about the side. <laughs> that was my take. Well, it's actually it's actually an interesting take because the, uh, when I first booted the game on my system, I was incredibly surprised by just how large the resolution of the sprites were and just how big the sprites were in general. Because you don't really see a lot of big sprite work on the N sixty four. Uh, I was actually curious, was this thanks to a combination of the high resolution mode, the sprite microcode, or the or was it anything else? Well, I think N64 is just capable of it. Uh, I don't know why uh, it's not done that much uh, with the system, but uh, it appears to me that uh, it, there, I didn't find any uh, technical difficulties to to have uh, high resolution and and big sprite. Maybe the uh, the expression pack uh, that I use uh, helps a lot uh, because uh, it needs uh, it requires a lot of uh, of memory in order to to have the frame buffers and to uh, and to store uh, the the sprites in memory. But apart from that, I didn't find um, a lot of difficulties. Uh, just I cannot. Uh, it's not possible to uh, to draw uh, a lot of sprites uh, in the same screen. Uh, uh, I had to to be careful about uh, how many sprites uh, I draw at uh, at one time. Awesome. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, you mentioned the music um, that was that was. Um freely available or whatever was that actually that was streamed right it wasn't uh real time yeah 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 well actually what i did is uh something that i talked about uh with boo uh, a few months ago uh um, i used the sound effect system uh, built uh, with uh, the new sys uh, framework uh but um you know the, the sound tools uh, hello has to uh, to make a uh, sound effect with that uh, but it's uh, it's only ten seconds uh, sound effect. So, uh, I use uh, the infinite mode uh, of this sound tool in order to uh, to be able to have sound uh, that lasts uh, much more longer than ten seconds. Uh, it's not a tool designed for that, uh, but I uh, I use it because it was uh, much more easier uh, to implement music uh, that way uh, instead of using. Uh, all the other stuff that I don't <laughs> understand, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, it's it's a streamed uh, indeed uh, using this uh, this method. Well, that, Alan, that sounds, oh, sorry, you're really going familiar on. with with how we actually got a, a audio engine working back in the day, but I don't remember exactly what we did. <laughs> That's cool though. <laughs> you, so you use the sound system as a buffer, basically. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, Alan over here would know plenty about the sound tools, ain't that right? <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for participating and being here for uh, the interview. All right, so next entry is Juicin64 by Keevan. Going to go ahead and calm. Hello, can you hear us? 
Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. All right, awesome. uh, tell us about what you did. Did you do everything, the sprites, the music? Yes and no. It's a solo project, so I was the only dev on it. Um, but I did make heavy utilization of open source assets that are out there and then modify them. For sure. Like, I didn't write all the music myself, obviously, right? <laughs> Uh, great. Um, and tell us about how you interpreted the theme and you used it in your title. Sure. Um, I think my interpretation is a little more esoteric, maybe, than the other entries. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of draw a relationship between, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, I guess, uh, like, you know, your typical gem rat and people that are, like, arcade users. So... If you're a big fan of arcade games, especially old arcade games, getting the top score is all that matters. It's like that is the goal itself, bigger numbers every day. And from my friends that go to the gym all the time, that's not me. Uh, it's the same thing. You know, it's all about going every day, getting bigger, bigger numbers just for the sake of it. Awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions about the entry? I was just going to. I was going to focus on the music. Were they so the? Did you actually sequence stuff, or were they mod files, or? Um... So they uh, they are mod files, um, which are freely out there, and most of my work on them was essentially editing them down and kind of fine tuning them, taking something someone else had made and making it better. Right. I actually miss and love those Amiga crunched heavy metal guitar sounds so it was great to hear that stuff again especially covering those songs it was <laughs> yeah it's pretty fun awesome thank you oh, those are some really great sound choices i really enjoyed the music in that hack or in the homebrew especially the fact that you could change the songs at any time i thought that was a really cool feature i implemented that feature after hearing the start of enter sandman about nine thousand times oh <laughs> yeah that's fair I played through it, I think, three or four times, and it was pretty addicting trying to get like a really good high score. Like I was really impressed by the gameplay of it. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Anyone else? So the the, the kind of non-combat thing is that kind of a a, a deliberate um, kind of aesthetic. Or I mean, you know, the way the way you talk about it is quite a subversive game with the anti. -gym. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, so there's a little bit of influence that I got from, you know, when I used to play like, uh, Mortal Kombat and stuff with like, you know, like round one, ready, fight. Uh, so I wanted to kind of undo that and reverse it and, and focus on positivity, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, anti-combat, I guess is kind of a focus. The whole purpose is to avoid <laughs> getting ticked off. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite you know, it, it, it's interesting because when when it, when it comes on, it kind of feels like you know your immediate well, my immediate frame of reference is it's like it's like, like Smash TV or something, but that's not what you're doing. You're you're running away. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on the Smash TV thing too. I didn't say it, but I was originally going for like a Robotron Smash TV feel, like that single screen arcade. Yeah. Oh, uh, cool, sweet, awesome. Um. Any other questions? Um, would you say, were you more influenced by the Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis with uh, kind of the style of your uh, homebrew? Uh, stylistically, I think especially if you look at the palette, it's a little more Genesis feel. Um, I had both growing up, but it was definitely more of, like, for me, a Genesis influence. I wanted this game to be something that didn't quite fit on the Nintendo 64 as we knew it. Yeah, definitely yeah. could see that joke, yeah. but that was really cool. Any other questions? Thank you very much for uh, participating and uh, being here for the interview. Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, so our next participant is Joel, who worked on Just Add Water. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Was just trying to find the unmute button, but all good now. Awesome. Uh, so tell us, what uh, did you do everything? So sprites and um, gameplay design and all of that? Is it all your yeah, work? Yeah, almost every, absolutely, almost everything. There's a few, just two tiny sprites, um, the little hand icons that I just couldn't manage to do myself, as well as the font. I just picked some random font from somewhere. 
Awesome. And uh, tell us how you interpreted the theme and you used it in your entry. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward in my entry. Mm -hmm. uh, you have what I think of as Tetris-like blocks, and uh, they change size as you play. Um, and the my idea was uh, clothes can shrink or dry in the wet um, as they uh, can shrink or grow depending on the weather um, or after the wash. It's a bit exaggerated, of course, but that's game design sometimes. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the entry? I mean, I I I, I think it's a stunningly original. Um, skinning for a game. I, mean, I, I, I can't. I can't think of anything remotely like a clothes washing game. Um, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I think the, you know, you, the, there may be some kind of like mini games in some RPG stuff um, that is a, a, a bit along that line. I, I, I think it's you know. I, I, th I think that that whole um, skinning of it just deserves further investigation. Uh -huh. um, and and yeah, I, I think really really impressive that you kind of you, you did everything. Um, I mean, I I the, the kind of feel like it is it would be it would be good for you to hook up with someone who could push the visuals, mm -hmm. um, and, and, get, and, and yeah, get some nice kind of stylized stuff in there. Um, I mean, because it yeah the, the the internal mechanics of it very much kind of to, to make a pun wear themselves on the sleeve because you can you know. It, 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 it shows you everything uh, in, yeah. in, in a fairly in a fairly revealing and kind of low level way as to as to how it's doing the scoring and stuff and things. But um, I I I I really I mean out of all the entries, I, I I think that was the most kind of blindsiding for what the what what the you know what the kind of thematic skinning would be. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, ha, ha, you know, I I I you know, I. I I, I, I do some teaching in game design students and stuff, and we yeah we we do all of this kind of freewheeling um, random ideas stuff. But um, how did you come up with that? Um, so it started a few years ago. The the kind of idea for the theme when I was a bit more interested in board game design, and I was living in a share house at the time. And uh, if you live in a share house, especially in Australia, um, where we mainly dry our clothes in the sun, I think more so than the parts of the world maybe um there's always a competition to get your clothes on the line first so it was kind of a competitive board game where um you could put your own clothes up and there's like weather system you roll the dice and you can see what might be coming up next and uh you could also in that game you could also like tear other people's uh, washing down and throw it on the ground. Um, so I didn't have a lot of time to work on this, and I, I admit it shows with the visuals especially. Um, so when I was desperate for any sort of idea for a theme, I thought, well, I can repurpose the board game idea. Um, and there you have it. And of course, I added the size changing mechanic based on the theme rather than the original idea. It's really interesting that you refer. It's, it's kind of it you know, has origins of some board game thinking because when 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 I when I saw it, the, the the thing, not that even that I've played the game very much, but it kind of the the board game patchwork sprung to mind, <laughs> you know, and and just the yeah. idea that you know, that you know, in fact, you know, as as you describe it, it could work really well as board game with um, you know, with 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 cloth tiles and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that it's grounded in personal experience of that story <laughs> about shared house and people fighting over closing the line is brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else have questions? I'll take that as a note. I actually have a question of my own. Uh, what made you decide to go with the dual hand setup for the game? Because uh, you use the D-pad for controlling the left hand and the C-pad for controlling the right. Why did you choose to do it like that instead of just having one single hand, which you could, for instance, use the control stick and it would be faster yeah. or something? Yeah. I think, I think in a way I was trying to force myself to be original, which is something I'm 
a lot of the ideas I've had throughout my life, not just for games, but for school assignments and everything. I always have sort of forced myself to do something original, even over maybe what's good. <laughs> um, so I thought very few 64 games use the D-pad and particularly the L button. So that was kind of my, I guess my motivating force is what's a controller configuration that hasn't really been used before. Um, and then I, I sort of stuck with that idea because I liked the chaos of trying to manage two things at once. It, I, I wasn't very good at the, the game myself, but I thought someone could get really good at this and it'd be quite an impressive feeling. Okay, thank you very much for participating and being here for the interview. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. All right, so our next team worked on Kumi Daiko Beat Off 64, and they're a team of four. Uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, is Rufio making it? Because he's offline, so... Yeah, I don't think so. We... we... Uh, let let them know that this was here, but they didn't come. Okay, well that's a bit of a shame. So uh, tell us what everyone worked on. Your four members. Um, did everyone share the work equally? Uh... Uh... Definitely not. <laughs> I, I I think Samuli and Peter did did most of the work. Uh, I I was pretty pretty busy doing other stuff, but uh, I I did contribute in naming the game, which is. Uh, a, a source of much pride for me. Yeah, and you did and, a beautiful, beautiful cover art as well. Yeah, that so, that's true as well. I was and, and of, uh, yeah, yeah, we uh, we all participated in the in the first kind of design sessions of of the of the game that you know what what kind of game we would like to make and so so on. But mo most of the technical stuff was all Samuli and Peter. Yeah, so between between me me and Better we divided it that I was I was doing the three D models and the graphics in the in the game and also implemented the audio. And, and I was working on the physics part of the game. I found that the fronting working all the collisions and the rope physics and getting the game feel to feel satisfying overall. Awesome. Uh, what did Rufio work on? Uh, they made all the audio, so all the audio assets. Oh, okay, that's a bit of a shame. Oh, Neil's sad now. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame that he's not here, because it would have been some good questions from Neil. Um, awesome. And tell us, how did you interpret the theme of the of the jam in, into your entry? So I think there was, uh, initially we were just bouncing around different ideas of how to how to put it in. Uh, and as the size is kind of like very close to mass and this kind of like a physics thing, so we decided to do something physics related. And then uh, based on a few iterations, we noticed that the best way of doing it was actually pretty directly. So if you kill the big enemy in the game, you get the power of, of getting your drum larger as well. And the further you play in the game, the more it is all about like keeping that big drum on by killing those big enemies. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Team Risto here. Um, your game is quite gorgeous. What was the inspiration behind your art style? We wanted to do something lighthearted, so it's not that like super serious looking. So we were first looking at hammers and boulders and all these kind of things, but then we were started to think what is more friendly to hit each other with. And then we came up with drums as they also gave us like a good idea of how to make the audio be, be nice. Awesome. Uh, speaking of graphics, I actually was surprised to see that your, your models have outlines around them. I'm going to assume that you use the inverse hole method for this. So you have a bigger model that you inverted the faces. Is that how you did it? Yes, that's yes. that's exactly yeah. how we did. Okay, cool. Uh, on, on on playing it, my one immediate regret was that I didn't have three other people to play it with. Um, yeah, me too. It's it, you know it it it, it, it it's such a, a from, from the moment it loads and you see that you're the little guy with the with the swinging drum. Um, 
it's it's wonderfully intuitive about how the game is going to play, and 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 it also kind of it reminds me of I mean when we were working on the first you know basically the first generation of N sixty four games at Rare, we were always trying to think of things to do with the stick, and twirling the stick was always on people's list of things to do, um, and I, I think it's really I think it's just really beautifully kind of referencing the kind of you know the, the console's origins because yeah that was the first time that people had a stick that they could do something with um so but regarding my question regarding the multiplayer was how did you guys under kind of lockdown conditions um manage to test that have you have you found a way to play online together or or are you is, yep. your, is your your dev team in a bubble or something we uh used parsec which is this sort of uh, share your screen and input over the internet uh, type of software. And then uh, we kind of loaded up the game in, in the uh, Project 64 emulator and, and started up Parsec. And well, uh, that's, that's the way we uh, well, played, played the multiplayer and also uh, shot the footage of the versus uh, trailer or what, whatever you'd call it, the gameplay video. No, really, really I mean that. Yeah, you know, that the one one thing about it is, you know, kind of you know, looking at it. I just feel like I'm judging, you know, almost like less than a quarter of the thing. I mean, it, it's you know, it, it, it's it's wonderfully intuitive and organic in the controls, and I'd just love to be playing it couch multiplayer with someone. Yeah, no, thanks. Was missing some extra people to play it with, and it did make me think of a Mario Party mini game. Exactly. Yeah, we really wanted to capture the experience of uh, getting getting your hand destroyed by the N sixty four controller for twirling it so much, and probably also destroying the controller itself in the process eventually. The the, the other thing I that, that sprung to mind playing it was, it would just be wonderful. I, I, it would be wonderful to have that where you could do something with the old. Um, yeah, N64 bongo controllers from the DK bongo game. Yeah, just tying the whole thing in, it would just be. A, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of imagining you know some people playing it and somebody else beating out a rhythm in the background on the on, on, on the bongo. <laughs> yeah, we actually referenced that in the cover art of the game. Although I think wasn't wasn't that uh, peripheral for the GameCube? Yeah, that was I GameCube, be I believe. Yeah, oh, still, we we did we did reference the bongo controllers in the in the cover art image. It, Wonderfully yeah, done. Yeah, wonderful stuff. I can it, I, I, I really. I mean, it, it also I think as people were saying with 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 the the graphic style of it, it felt very very Nintendo. Um, and you know, and, and and also the the quirky the quirky naming as well. I think is, is, is wonderful. The, uh, the core mechanic reminded me of our first Nintendo 64 testing uh, controller days where Dave, who was on the team, he actually wrote our sound engine, um, would play and would press really hard on the analog joystick. And the first controllers they sent us had very thin support for the nub on the top of the joystick. And he would be frenetically like kind of pushing the joystick back and forth and the top would pop off. And I think more than three times he punctured his thumb on the terminal for the joystick. And so I, I think because of Dave, they actually ended up modifying the design of the support for the head of the joystick because he was so prone to breaking it that they found that it was, it wouldn't hold up to uh, to a like really frenetic action. So I can only imagine if this game would have been released back then, it would have been just a like a perfect stress test for that type of play mechanic. But I love the, um, I love the physics play for sure. Awesome. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for being here, uh, all three of you. Sadly, it's a shame that the audio guy wasn't able to to be here, but it was still pretty interesting. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. organizing this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. This was awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Okay, uh, our next participant is Daniel Face, who worked on Lunar Assault 64. 
Hello, can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me fine? Mm -hmm. Yep. Lovely. Yep. yep. Hey. Awesome. Uh, so tell us, you what did you make? Uh, did you make all the art, all this music? Tell us. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I did the 3D modeling and the programming and like the texture art for Lunar Assault, as well as, um, sorry, I'm kind of losing my words now that I'm saying it, as well as any sort of like animation or writing. Uh, the only thing I don't really feel the same amount of authorship over was the songs in the game. Those are like public domain songs that I found online. Uh, the reason for that is just that I'm not very good at composing music. One thing I did like about the sounds, though, was I used like an emulator for like an old Sega Genesis like sound chip, and then made the samples that way, and then put it in, and that was kind of fun because I felt like I was giving my own um, like Sonic character <laughs> to the game. I really enjoyed that. Awesome! And tell us, how did you interpret the theme and use it in your entry? Yeah, um, I feel like I interpreted it in two ways. The first, I think, is maybe a bit obvious. There are these big monsters on the moon, and you have to go slay them. And then the other way, which I don't feel I did the best job at, uh, is that like the game's kind of about this protagonist getting like disillusioned with their day job, right? And uh, I tried to make like them have like all these like passions and like initiative and like you know like in the, they're very green and they're very like enthusiastic right and they're kind of coming up against like this big giant industrial economic social like kind of machine that their job exists in right like there's software companies and like um like like millions of dollars moving around and it's all in space and there's like big industry and like ronald reagan's like the emperor of the world like you know making them feel like a tiny thing in a very big place Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, <laughs> was the weapon inspired by uh, the Halo Spartan laser, or was it inspired by something else? Oh, yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think initially it kind of came from the big satellite laser in the movie Akira. But also uh, in Gears of War, you kind of have a weapon like that. And I remember finding it very captivating as a teenager, because it's it's not like a gun, right? Like, it comes out of the sky. Yeah, it was really rewarding playing that game and finally, like, syncing up the shot and charging it up all the way. I really liked that feature. I'm glad you did, actually. Um, I really wanted it to have that pop, you know? Like, it goes do-do-do-do-do, and the pitch gets higher, and then the noise cranks up, you know? Yeah, exactly. The audio on that was perfect. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was absolutely lovely um, and it, you know, I, I, I love the subversive backstory and, and the writing um, you know, it, 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 it was sharp and, and, and funny and didn't overstay its welcome um, <laughs> I, I, I thought yeah and, and yeah and, and also that the, the, the arc you, you, know, you only have the kind of like you know the, the the, the three kind of boss um, monsters you're hunting, um, but you know you, you could feel it turning a little bit dark, and 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 then also it caught me by surprise because it very rapidly went dark when he just turns up and goes, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of it, and and, and 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 that for me kind of it, it, it felt like it referenced a whole bunch of stuff like. Um, you know, like Monster Hunter and even, I guess, um, Shadow of the Colossus. Um, mm -hmm. thing, things, things that have gone before. Mm. Just from, from from a technical point of view, I I, I love the how the kind of landscape. Um, you know, that's something you don't see in that generation of 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 games. Um, but that was kind of part of this part of the you know what the thing that you were exploiting to fight against the monster was was using a landscape to get lines of sight and height and stuff and things um, <laughs> i another thing i mean yeah a, a question which which 
was something about it which which I felt was very much um, it felt it had a lot of integrity to those that that generation of games was that when we were making early 3D games there were no there was no kind of accepted mode for controls you know the the, the kind of dual stick controller you know movement camera stuff was was not there and certainly on the n64 you were crippled by the fact that you wanted to have dual sticks but only had one stick um i i, I really like the feel of that kind of stuff with the d-pad and, and 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 the camera rotation on, on on the stick and and it really immediately put me back in mind of, the, of those early games so was that a deliberate feel that you were going for with that or was it you know just kind of out of the constraints of the input device um that's a good question i think you kind of i think touched a bit on the feelings i had there um maybe just to kind of elaborate a bit like i i didn't play very many of the first person shooters on the nintendo 64 growing up and so you know, they had a very different paradigm of controls compared to like a twin stick, like Halo or, you know, like any modern third person or first person shooter. Uh, so I very much kind of felt like I was transplanting those Halo experiences back onto it by like making the D-pad like W-A-S-D and then turning the stick in that way. That, that was kind of how I was coming at it. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question though. <laughs> No, I mean, you, you kind of, I, but it just, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I you know, my, in my comments, I, I just felt, I mean, it, was, it, it felt to me like Body Harvest meets Monster Hunter. <laughs> That's awesome. Which, I, you know, that, that, that was, you know, they, they, they just sprung into my mind as I, as I was playing it. Aw. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, uh, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any questions? I'm all ears. Hey, Daniel. Your game was uh, it's very, very ambitious, by the way. Um, what were the technical constraints you had to overcome to get this playable on the N64? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, I think the first thing is that, uh, and I think one thing I have a bit of like regret about the submission is that uh, I, there's a lot of polygons in kind of the map sort of thing. Uh, and I had to make sure the fill rate, like I wasn't exhausting the fill rate of the RCP chip. Um, let me think about this a little more. So some things I did to get around that was use uh, like a reject processing microcode that kind of made it look like a PlayStation 1 kind of game. Um, I was really aggressive with culling and switching to like a lower amount of detail and also selectively turning on and off Z buffering. So. Uh, like the environment field that you play in the game is sliced up into sections. And then depending on the player's orientation, they're drawn in a certain order without Z buffering. And you might kind of notice that as you go from like north to east or like east to south, um, sometimes like the or ordering of those polygons flicker or change. Um, that's because there's essentially like conditional for loops that we wrote, go through to determine which sections of the world to draw front to back. Um, that was probably, I think, the trickiest thing because it was a trade-off between like detail or uh, frame rate or um, or just like you know like making sure it was true to the experience and it made you feel like good about it, uh, but at the same time also like not being too like slow or like overwhelming because the player is really trying in that quick frame moment to try to aim and strike the right beast sort of thing. Um, and if it if it's too detailed and it's too slow, then it's not going to feel right. Uh, I wish I zoomed the map, made the map bigger in scale or size. I feel like there's a lot of times where like there's all this like small fidelity detail with the tiles and I feel like it could have been more interesting and more engaging if like the player was just smaller with respect to the scale of the map. Yeah, I think it turned out pretty well. And I think the UI border was a good compromise to having the render to render less on screen and mm -hmm. also having like a little stylish like that like that little portrait of the character in the bottom right. I think that was a very cool decision you made there. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, having a small scissor region I think helped a lot. 
Awesome. Um, any more questions? All right. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for participating. And yeah, thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, our next participant is Spirit of 1776, who made Retro Dash. Hello, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, all good here. So well, tell thanks. us, uh, what did you work on in your entry? Did you do everything? Programming, sound, music, um, sprites? Uh, yeah, so um, I did the programming. Um, the all the game assets. Well, I made the tiles, but the like the player sprite uh, and the the music was taken from like freely available um, resources on the web. Uh, I put like the links. Oh, and the fonts um, that was taken. Um, there's there's like a free font. I put I put all that in the credits. So if you're interested in in that, but yeah, I'm I'm a programmer like as my job. So kind of stick with what I know. Um, and yeah, this was like my first uh, game jam ever. Uh, so it was kind of a, an interesting experience, especially because I was supposed to start as a team. And then my partner kind of bailed. So I uh, had to go it alone. And uh, didn't know anything about coding for the N64. So it was a little bumpy at the start. Um, and uh, But luckily, I kind of got some help. Um, uh, this guy, Kiven, he made the Juicin 64 game. He helped me out uh, with some questions I had. I used this LibDragon, so he, he kind of was a little more familiar with it than I was. So um, got some help from him. But then once I kind of got started, it was great. Um, progress was, was pretty good. Um, and I actually... Do you want me to keep talking? I don't know if you had specific no, questions. No, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So uh, anyways... Um, yeah, I made good progress and kind of finished it up, I don't know, maybe about a week and a half before the deadline and uh, gave it to my wife to try out. And she's like, yeah, this is impossible. It's too hard. And I'm like, yeah, you just suck at video games. So I gave it to some friends and they're like, yeah, this is impossible. Way too hard. I'm like, oh, crap. So spent like the next week uh, progressively making the game easier. And uh, it was kind of an interesting experience because for me, I could beat all the levels on like one or two tries. Because uh, I had played it so many times over and over and over again. But to anyone who hadn't played it, um, oh yeah, it was definitely it was pretty hard. So I kind of added in uh, like a speed slider so you could like kind of change the speed of the game and and then uh, like add some checkpoints because people were kind of pissed by having to like get to the very end and then restart. But uh, it was it was a great it was it was kind of a great experience, um, you know, and and it was it was kind of a fun uh thing to learn and, and and i won't lie like you know as a kid uh playing n64 so much and then actually getting to run my own code on it it was like the first time i did it i'm like oh man this is this is pretty cool you know i never thought in a million years that i would ever write code that would run on the n64 uh so yeah overall had a great uh great time doing it awesome and tell us how did you interpret the theme and use it in your entry yeah, so basically, um, you know, you can kind of change your size. I kinda, you know, I kind of took it pretty literally, uh, uh, changing size to, to kind of get past these different obstacles in the game. Um, and, you know, like, uh, kind of had some, some more grand ideas, but um, I kind of wanted some to, to keep it realistic for one person. So you got small, medium, large, and kind of go through these little tunnels. And then you kind of break through these bricks uh, when you're large, and you can also jump higher and, and farther. So um, that's kind of the the size aspect of it. And and honestly, I think it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, it was a little bit of a challenge, kind of tuning the levels uh, to the different jumps. And um, you know, if I, I wish I had like an in-game editor, it would have made it a lot easier. Like everything was just kind of made with a text file. Um, and then I kind of like process that text file into like uh, it's like a binary array that um, that I, I just kind of read. And that was also fun figuring out that like the Nintendo 64 is big Indian and because uh, like nothing was working. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And then, uh, but yeah, so uh, that's kind of how I did um, did sizes. Uh, yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I mean, I, I, you, 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 you've answered my questions, but I'll, 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 ask, I'll ask them again because there were things that struck me about the game. Um, you know, one thing that I thought was really quirky about it was the kind of the, the meta thing, which is that, you know, in, in that generation of, 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 of consoles, we didn't have endless runners. I mean, the, yeah. the endless <laughs> are very much they're very much a product of the kind of mobile mobile phone generation of games and it i i i just love that kind of meta where it's retro dash but it's a, it's a retro game for a genre that didn't exist at the time yeah I mean, you know it's kind of funny yeah that that's that's i kind of thought of that too because uh the first time i ever played one yeah it was on like this old ipod touch that i had and i kind of like <laughs> fell in love with it and then I'm like, why didn't people think of this like back then? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we didn't. I wish we had. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> we were too busy trying to use every possible permutation of button and movement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. We, we were trying to be way, way too clever. Um, <laughs> and, and one thing, and, and again, you answered it beautifully, was that one thing about it which I thought was, 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 was really well done were the tutorials, and the scalable difficulty and the checkpoints, um, you know, and 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 I, I think it, it 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 speaks volumes for your kind of craft that you took that on board from feedback from you know you said your wife and other people, um, yeah, because it, it 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 it's such a common thing in game design that you know when we make games we make them to challenge ourselves, but we become blind to the fact that we've become experts at it. By the oh, time definitely. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, like you guys, I've never made a game professionally, you know, and and but yeah, like it's kind of sucks to have someone tell you, like, yeah, your game is impossible and too hard. Like, and I was like, like you know, my, my wife told me that first, and but then when like someone I like, you know, trust that's a good video game player. I, I love my wife, but you know, <laughs> um, but you hear that, you're kind of like, oh man, like now what? Like, and, and like, do I have to like restart all over? Like, so I kind of like. It was too late to kind of like change anything too radically. So the speed slider was kind of like a last minute thing. And then when I resent it out, everyone's like, oh yeah, like this is this is kind of great. Uh, I can I can kind of tone it down and then kind of crank it up as I get better. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of where I came from on that. No, great adaptive iterative, iterative design, I thought. Um, yeah, one, one question, did, did you, uh, the, are the levels handcrafted, or did you move toward kind of having procedural generation of them? Well, they, they're they're all handcrafted, and like I, I mentioned, I wish I had like some more like sophisticated tools. Like my original, the original sort of idea was that the jumps would kind of be more time to the music, um, and that turned out to be pretty hard to do. Like from like listening to this in like VLC and then like trying to like change characters in a text file. And like, I didn't want to kind of go down this rabbit hole of like building some like really sophisticated like tool cause I would have never finished it to kind of build these in game. So it's all handcrafted. And what I tried to do was like listen to the music and listen to points in the songs where like maybe like some like new voices came in or like samples changed or something like that. And then maybe like change a little bit theme of the level but uh it's it's and then naturally like when you die with checkpoints enabled it just like restarts at the beginning because like it uses these things called like mod files and it's really hard to like go to a specific like one like 12.2 seconds you can't really do that with the like the sound library for lib dragon so i'm like well for checkpoints it just has to restart so i tried the best i could like with the with the level design but you know i think that's one area that like if i had like a an actual designer uh, I think that that would have been great to kind of work with someone like that that could really kind of take it to the next level. No, cool. That really, really interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? All right. I guess not. Thank you very much yeah, for I being here. Say, I just wanted to say thanks for for organizing this. I know you guys put a lot of work into it, and I had a great time. And I, you know, I met some cool people, and hopefully, uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you very much for being Thanks, here. Spirit. Yeah. All right. We'll uh, take it easy, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 
All right, our next entry is Tecto by In the Beef and Wise Guy. Calling them now. Hello, can you Everyone. hear us? Yep. Wise oh. Guy here. Awesome. Um, In the Beef is going to be using text channel instead. Works for us. All right. So uh, tell us, uh, you're a team of two. Who did what in the game? So I was the programmer for the game, and in the beef did all the visuals, art assets, that sort of stuff. And a lot of the uh, art direction as well. Pretty much most of it. Awesome. And tell us, how did you interpret the theme and use it in your entry? So as far as the theme goes uh, with size, we went with the idea that the player could control the size of certain objects in the world. And so you'll notice that every interaction you can do with something in the world involves changing its size in some way, whether that be shrinking it or growing it, and then it returns back to normal size after you finish interacting with it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? No, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't, I didn't from, from, from playing it, I didn't get that scaling thing as the size thing. Um, it, for, for me, it really came across that he was a a charming, tiny little guy in a big world. Um, the question about the character design. I I, I really, really like the character design. Um, I, I think it's a great little avatar. Um, just wondering what your references were for it. I mean, it, for, for me, it immediately kind of made the kind of like the the the, the taluses, the taluses, whatever they're called in in in, in Breath of the Wild. Kind of sprung to mind and another thing about it as i really like the asymmetry in the character um with the with the you know the, the big right arm and the the small the, the, the small left arm um and, and a kind of a follow-on question about one of the things that sprung out when i was playing it visually was the um there was some nice kind of alpha texture blending on the ground um as you left the cave at the start, which I just know was a thing that was a complete pain to do back in the day. And also the the, the little animated textures on the on the, the water kind of mud and stuff and things. I thought a really nice touch. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Beef designed the character, so I'm sure she'll have some stuff to say in response to that. Looks like she's typing right now. All right. Uh, while we wait, I'm going to ask the the water animation is pretty cool. How did you guys accomplish that? So the water animation, it's really funny, actually. Um, the water animation is 600 uh, different textures. I think 600 hex, actually, different textures. And so, no, no, it's Cecil. Um, that all that data, because we didn't get around implementing any sort of compression, of the four megabyte ROM, around two and a half megabytes are just water textures that are <laughs> DMA'd in at runtime. It DMA's, uh, I think, two frames in advance, the water texture is going to be displayed. So it has a buffer of three at a time. Might be two. All right, so In the Beef says, early on, Wise Guy pointed me towards some golems from Ghibli. I pretty much just doodled it, and I suppose it ended up like the stone talus from Breath of the Wild. Set up the water in Blender with fancy seamless repeating noise junk. Still has oh, more. Oh yeah, he did a, quite a lot of very cool work in Blender with generating the uh, a lot of the more procedural textures, like the the water is all completely generated per, uh, procedurally, and the waterfall texture as well. The little like water splash. That's done with just a scrolling texture and some playing around with alpha thresholding. That is another texture that in the beef generated via Blender. Awesome. We'll wait for her to finish typing. In the meantime, does anyone else have any questions? Just a comment about the 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 character in its in, in in its world i mean it felt to me like a really nice a really nice fit um you know it it, it, it i i just you know it, it made me feel like i wanted to explore more of that world and 
and just the kind of I really like the non competitive kind of interactions, you know, very kind of organic and, you know, kind of thoughtful and kind of pastoral stuff. Um, yeah, very, very charming. Yeah, early on, uh, one of the ideas that uh, be floated with me was the idea of just not having a health system whatsoever and just nothing can do damage. At most, it would just be something can impede your progress. And I like that idea too a lot. So we went forward with that and there's no sort of hazards in the game besides things that just keep you from moving forward, like falling in the water, you have to climb back out. Um, there's nothing that's going to damage you. There's no enemies. And that ended up, I think it worked nice. If we had had, you know, obviously the game ended up being pretty short just because of time limitations. We spent a lot of time working on the engine and sort of the art design. And then the actual time we had to add content to the game was fairly limited. But, you know, the idea would have been if we had more time, would have made more world with, again, nothing that can uh, damage you. It would just be stuff you have to get around, basically. Uh, and the beef continues. The alpha texture blending on the ground was actually just its own texture. It was simpler that way since two cycles is a necessity for multi-texturing, and I always lean towards better performance, even if it's just a, con a couple polygons. Awesome. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I think it turned out really well. Your uh, guys's project, like, it's, the scaling, really reminded me reminded me a lot of like Alice in Wonderland kind of feel with it, and uh, the cell shading esque like mimicry you guys did with the look of it really turned out nice. Just uh, congrats all around. Thank you. In the beef says thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, anyone else have any more questions? All right. Uh, thank you very much for being here and participating in the game jam. Yeah, thank you for having us. All right, bye-bye. Okay, our next entry is Telecation Gemini, and it's made by Lambert, JTN, and Cobra. Hello. Hello. Okay, so you guys are a team of three. Tell us how you split the work for your, uh, your, your game. Well, uh... Lambert James was our programmer, and so he really organized stuff, I feel like. he, I, I think he kept everybody organized. Um, I did uh, audio, so music and sound effects. And um, what... I, Cobra was mostly um, 3D modeling. Uh, he can clarify exactly uh, how much of what he did. I think uh, Lambert James did some uh, 3D modeling, too. I did the uh, the character modeling and the the collectibles, and some mm -hmm. models for the beginning cutscene. Mhm. Mm yeah, and then I, I was like programming and level design mostly. We all contributed to level design to some degree. I think I, I kind of spearheaded it though. Awesome. And tell us, how did you look at the theme and interpret it into your entry? So, so we just had two. The, the idea was that we have two different playable characters of different sizes, and their size kind of dictates what they can and can't do. And you have to use them together to solve puzzles, and so you, know, just, you can switch back and forth between them. And yeah, that's yeah. We we had a few different ideas, and we voted on our favorites and took the best parts of those favorites, and that's kind of how we arrived at. Um the platforming idea. Right. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any questions for our participants? Um, yeah, I was just really impressed by the whole engine. Even just the camera controls are really cool or the ending animations when you complete a level. I was just wondering, it kind of reminded me of Bomberman 64. Were there any 64 games that you guys took inspiration from? Hmm. And it's hard to say because, like, I, I, I have, there's nothing that I was thinking of specifically. I don't know if I don't know if you guys had anything you had in mind. I know, I'm, uh, JTN had had a lot of things that he was pulling inspiration from. But uh, for me, it was more um, wasn't so much until sixty four games, but like uh, old Looney Tunes cartoons set in space, that kind of aesthetic. That's kind yeah. of what I had in mind. And um, 
Well, so I was a really big fan of Banjo Kazooie, and uh -huh. that made me really uh, excited about doing a 3D platformer like that. Um, right. I drew some inspiration from Diddy Kong Racing. I was a big fan of that one too. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we I kind of tried to uh, get people excited about like nostalgia and retro stuff, and we kind of joked about um, the kind of cartoons in the '90s, that color scheme, and uh, even maybe we thought about doing funnier like '90s music and stuff too, but that d didn't really fit. Yeah, I can definitely kind of see almost like the Space Jam sort of 90s vibe. It looks really good in the game. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. Awesome. Uh, any well, other questions? No, oh, just not a question. I so just more saying this felt more like a complete game. You know I mean, I could imagine if this was extended with different puzzles and things, you, you'd be buying right. this game. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think I had the goal to about halfway through to spend most most of the second half spent polishing it rather than like you know try to get all the main mechanics in first half of the jam and then focus on the second half of the jam just polishing and and, and iterating so i'm glad well, it, i'm glad that that it honestly it shows that it feels polished if you're like, a lot of games main jam in particular feel rushed whereas this felt as you said polished you'd, you'd put effort into making it feel right and and shows yeah I, I i for me it just exudes polish and I, it, it, it's it's interesting to hear other people confirming that um it's i i things that really stood out were the level design and the progression everything just felt very very well attuned to the kind of flow as you learned how the game systems worked Mm -hmm. things just became subtly more challenging the crystals became harder to find that became these things where you you know getting on top of the robot was you couldn't get under you, you you'd knock yourself off the uh, on the on the on the first kind of toxic um mm -hmm. radioactive thing you know you immediately think oh i get on top of the robot and no i knock, knock myself off and and that kind of vibe to it really felt to me like the best of kind of Mario um, level progression, you know, show a mechanic, learn a mechanic, challenge the mechanic, um, mm -hmm. lovely stuff. I love the kind of retro thing where, you know, your, your kind of front end with the little kind of, um, <laughs> I, I say FMV lightly, but they kind of, you know, right. like, <laughs> You know, yes. playing to the you know, you 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 want you want to do a you want to do a kind of exposition and a kind of um, theatrical thing, but obviously we're constrained by memory and what we can do. So you judiciously chose some nice, um, you know, still frames and 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 jump between them beautifully. Um, also, that little thing of the. Off, off the rocket going through space at the start, rendered with the, you know, with with the old cranky reflection mapping that we used to have. Yeah. But then we, <laughs> when you revisit it, you revisit it as a sprite, as a, as a rendered sprite. So that that I thought that was was really lovely. Um, kind of picked up picked up the feel of Pikmin as well. He, I felt a bit Olimar yeah. as I was dropping Definitely. off. Definitely. Um, so I, I, I don't really have, I, I don't really have questions. I've got a lot of praise. I, I, I think you did a lot of things really, really well. And another thing I noticed was the, as the little guy running up the slope, you run up the slope, but you can't get quite up the slope and you do the Mario 64 slide back down again. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really nice little touch. Um, and, and, and just the controls, you know, you, you're, you're placed in this kind of, you know, perilous jumping experimental environment, the control, I very rarely missed time to jump or fell off, um, which, which you know, speaks volumes for the integrity of the controls. And I think, as someone mentioned, that using the C buttons in that way to do the kind of, you know, lurk between camera positions, again, you know, that, 
that really nice, nicely references those early days of the N64, where mm -hmm. camera control, you know, as as kind of typified by like Kiryu in, in 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 the Mario game, we didn't really know how to represent camera control, and it was a very kind of atomic thing. You would press a button, yeah. and it would, you know. So yeah, and also the being able to scroll around the map, you know, the the the, the kind of alternate gameplay thing where you step outside of the game to scroll around the map and scale and rotate to find where the crystals are so yeah i i'm i'm I, i've got nothing but praise for it i think it's a lovely lovely game thank you thanks it means a lot yeah uh, you mentioned the progression there and when i first started playing i was thinking I'm not sure how size fits into this. And then the big robot appeared. I was like, ah, here we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it, it was a nice progression in that learning how to do all things. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad the size that, 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 that you had that moment because I was worried that like, you know, we if we'd spend too long before we got to the size mechanic that it wouldn't be entirely clear. But yeah. No, I think you got that spot on. It was it was just just as I was thinking. I'm not sure. Oh, here he is, big robot, right? There's a size thing. They have to jump between them. Awesome. Um, any more questions? Uh, I just want to reiterate, like how this could have been a retail game that released 25 years ago. That's how that's how polished it is. That's how good it is. So very high praise that, for that. That actually means a lot. Uh, yeah. And, thank you. And. Um, I want to yeah, pay special making... tributes to the controls. The controls felt amazing. Very good uh, game feel. Um, the character really moves around very playfully, very bouncy, very nice physics. I want to ask you, how did you get that good of a game feel with your character controller? Um, I, I mean, I, I wanted to make sure that they that there's some momentum, but then just been play testing it. I tested it on my wife, and she gave me some feedback and like. Um, had found that like you know when, when you're holding the button down there's there's actually slightly less gravity so you fly up and then you let go that's when gravity gets stronger for the jump i think that that's that's an idea that i've picked up from somewhere else talking about platformers and for the movement slowing down accelerates faster than speeding up mm -hmm. because before that it felt really floaty like you were on ice but but making that change made it so you, know, you stop faster so you know you, you could you could make turns better just, just, just trying that over and over again, trying on people and, and and seeing how how it felt. So just a lot of iteration and um, trying to have it behave somewhat like real physics, so at least it's familiar. So that's best I can very, just describe. Very that. well done. Thank you. And awesome. I want to ask uh, JTN a music question. The music is very evocative of that era, which I was very impressed by. Um, what were your, some of your inspirations behind the music for this game? Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of Grant Kirkhope, uh, for one. Uh, David Wise, also. Uh, Donkey Kong Country was kind of the first game that got me into video games, so it inspired me a lot. Um, and then I was, I was like, looking for space-sounding things, and I thought of, like, John Williams... Um, and I used some music theory to know I should probably use the Lydian mode for that. Um, and yeah, uh, just, just kind of a mix of, of, of a bunch of different things that I like. And I feel like I kind of put it in a blender and tried to make something that I still liked. <laughs> yeah, your inspirations came across very well. So kudos for that. I, 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 I'll, I'll pass on your... Your, your your thoughts to Dave and Grant because I'm, I'm I'm in touch with them still, but one one thing again that struck me really as 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 the levels changed, the minute we went to the level that had the toxic sludge, you had this kind of ominous bassy thing going on in the background, and I thought that was really really nice. It just kind of completely prefigured the fact that you were now on a level where you could get hurt by part of the background. So I, 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 I thought that was a really nice touch. Thanks. Um, so something that I, I tried to push our programmer on was trying to uh, not uh, settle for the general MIDI sounds. And it was like really difficult. And so we did go with that. 
Um, but I was inspired by like using sound fonts from uh, from rare games and stuff. And uh, so, yeah. Cool. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much for being here and for the uh, for the interview and for your participation. Thank you, guys. This has been great. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's really great. appreciate Thanks. everything you've done. All right. Uh, next entry is the swoop. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so you're a team of two who worked on the swoop. Tell us uh, who did what. Um, so yeah, Milwikis um, did most of the um, gameplay, I want to say, and uh, Catonator did all the music composition. I think he always did fantastic work, so you know I just had to get him. And um, Arukis wrote most of the um, heads-up display interface. And he also wrote uh, some gameplay code as well. And me, I just was in charge of, for the most part, getting everything to work on the console, um, which was a was an experience. Awesome. And uh, tell us, how did you interpret the theme and use it in your entry? Hmm. Um, it was mostly Milwakis that thought of the idea because he's, you know, he's <laughs> It's all about the birds. If you want to go over that, Milikis. Yeah. Uh, well, I think they were saying that um, I was gonna do the do the art and graphics for it, and they said you draw birds best. So we decided on the bird and um, thought about what crows do. And they, I don't think they actually do it, but they're known for like stealing things. So I thought it'd be fun to swoop down and take stuff and build up a little pile. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Who's, whose choice was it to put the wonderful slap bass music at the intro? <laughs> <laughs> that was our uh, comp composer, Catenator. I loved it. <laughs> Bit of a shame that uh, Catenator can't be here. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I did forget to mention that, yeah, about the graphics, too. Um, yeah, um, Arukis made the heads-up display graphics and all the menu graphics. I slapped together the uh, N64 logo. Um, Milikis wrote, um, I believe, the bird graphics, and um, he made all the models for us. And then um, I mostly did the skybox and the grass. Awesome. Uh, Doak, I believe you... Um, I, 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 I think it's lovely. I mean, I... <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 it's... I, I love the way that it reminds me of Pilot Wings, but is <laughs> completely different. Um, yeah, it's kind of Pilot Wings meets Katamari with the collecting um, and, the, and the, the growing scale and insanity of the things you collect. Um, that's a really, really nice touch. And I, I, talking about the HUD, I mean, I, I think the motion graphics on the kind of interface and the HUD stuff is superb. Um, you know, that, that's kind of a field that we no one was really thinking of back in those days. Um, but all of that animated stuff and scaling and pop and things is, 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 is lovely. So, um, you know, it was was Katamari. I mean, Katamari must have been an inspiration for for, for how it works, and 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 Pilot Wings as well. Are, are those your two kind of touchstones? I uh, I actually haven't played Pilot Wings, but Katamari was a inspiration, or Katamari. I don't know how to pronounce that. And um, uh, also a game on Steam called Feather, which has sort of bird flight physics, uh, also sort of an inspiration. Yeah, in the beginning of the game jam, I jokingly said that anyone who made a Katamari clone would get full points from me, and looks like you guys took that a bit literally. <laughs> Rage. <Rigged. laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I think it's very impressive uh, from a technical standpoint, like the scope of the game, how big the world is, how the graphics look. 
Um, what were the, some of the technical hurdles you had to overcome to get this to a playable, nice day like this? Well, um, there were definitely some struggles. Um, one struggle that we encountered during the beginning was uh, merging um, some different libraries. For example, um, you have LibUltra, of course, and then there's a new system that uh, does some things for you. It's essentially a wrapper over LibUltra. And we were, I, at first, I was, you know, slapping together um, our core engine just using pure Lib Ultra. And so when I was, um, I was looking into the wrapper library called uh, New System, and um, I'm like, okay, so let's try to get that running on that instead. So as I was merging everything over, um, I noticed that <laughs> we would we would get far. We got far, but then the, the moment I tested it on console, <laughs> you just get a black screen. <laughs> so um, that's how it so, goes. Yeah, that was an in, that was an interesting thing to um, get working. I was fiddling around with the code, trying to see what was wrong, and um, turns out that I was missing a simple instruction that did not seem like it would cause the whole thing to hang on the black screen. Uh, so that took a few days. Um, there was another hurdle, um, which I'm trying to remember. We had it, graphics. Yeah, the sprites. Uh, the fill rate. That's, um, oh man. So the, <laughs> Malawikis, uh, do you want to go over the, I believe, besides the 2D sprite stuff, some of the other yeah. graphic girls? We had problems with the SP library, um, getting that working. That took a few days, but performance-wise, um, I think it was mostly the fill rate. I don't have any experience for Nintendo 64, and I don't have one. I was kind of working blind, trying things and saying, uh, try this. Um, like moving, removing vertices or shrinking models and stuff. Um, and I think the only thing that really helped was uh, pulling out objects outside of the view and um, sort of batching draws. So we only load the texture once and then draw the models of that texture. Those are the only things I think made a difference in performance. I think that you basically discovering the stuff that we discovered on the N64 at the start. It was uh, mm -hmm. get culling things as much as possible and not drawing things as much as possible. So, yeah. Yeah, it was fun to figure that stuff out. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? Just, just another thing. I'm just watching the watching the video in another window. But I think I'll, I'll definitely call that as being really nicely done. Is 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 using that kind of dither around the yeah you know, the, the, the 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 camera axis to, to to keep keep visibility on your character. You know, in 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 the absence of any kind of meaningful alpha blending and stuff on N64, that's a really nice compromise for it, and it, it I think it works really well. Yeah, it took a while to figure out how to do on the Nintendo 64. Cool, that was working. I know that um, <laughs> in, <laughs> I think in some of the emulators that they, it just did not work. I tried Project 64, but if you use like a uh, different video plugin, it just shows up <laughs> as a white, <laughs> as a white pixel, like pixel mess <laughs> instead of it being, you know, uh, drawn. In, uh, behind everything. Yeah, that that happened to me, and it confused me initially. I was like, "Why have they done this?" This, but yeah, <laughs> when you see it working properly, it's like, "Oh, okay, it makes sense now." Why did they put this giant white block? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, any other questions? Uh, I got pretty far into the game. I think I got to the point where I could pick up a fence. Um, in the end game, can you end up picking up like a house, for example? The house is fixed, but you could pick up 
uh, all the trees and planks and stuff. Um, <laughs> the signs on the grocery store. Uh, oh, yeah. The houses was... themselves are part of the map. <laughs> uh, that was really cool, though. Um, do you have a favorite item pickup? Like, like, what's the funniest thing you pick up in your mind in this game? Uh, I put. In I like. I like the chicken. Critic. <laughs> the chicken. Yeah, I like the chickens too. Um, yeah, trying to keep the make it look like a chicken uh, without, you know, taking up too many resources. Mine, of course, has to be the <laughs> um, the N sixty four logo, of course. Oh yeah, it's the best. Um, we had ideas that unfortunately we couldn't make it in because of time constraints, but um, we had ideas for like different screens for different objects. Um, we included two characters, um, you know, of people that we like, our YouTubers mostly. Um, I believe uh, James, I forgot his last name, and um, Doug Walker. Um, we had ideas to like include screams from them, but uh, we just ended up running out of time. A James Rolfe, like the angry video game nerd, or a different James? Yes, uh, James Rolfe. Rolfe. Oh, nice. Oh, <laughs> That's <nice>. awesome. <laughs> They're kind of staring, uh, him and Doug Walker kind of staring each other down in the plaza. It's easy to miss. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, the modeling is really well done in this game. I I think I forgot to mention the modeling and the assets were very nice. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for being here and for participating in the game jam. Yeah. Thank you. Guys for yeah. Thank you. In. So tell us, uh, your team of two, who did what? Yeah. Um, so um, initially, um, so the, basically the way that this got set up was. Um, Geist originally reached out to me where we were like, oh, let's work together on something because we'd worked together in the past. Um, and we, we weren't quite sure what our availability was going to be. We were going to kind of see what happened. Um, for the first, I would say, what, guys, like four, four or five weeks, you were just swamped with work. Yeah, for um, six weeks. Like the last week in November was when I got your message yeah. that you wanted to go ahead alone. And I realized that I haven't actually had any time whatsoever and took a range for yeah. change that. So for about uh, at least five or six weeks, like he said, um, it was pretty much just me um, because, you know, that's, that's what happens. Yeah, uh, trying to get time together for something that's not your day job. You know, sometimes you get busier than you expect. So for at that point, basically the the core engine related stuff was uh, mine that I was built up. Um, up to that point, then guys came in. He finally had some time in the fast past, you know, two two and a half weeks, whenever it exactly was. I don't recall exactly the time frame, and he was able to help me um, optimize some of my my code, like the physics related stuff, the collision related stuff. Um, provide some three D models, like the um, ship model, as well as some textures and some some other additions. Did you want to go into a little bit more about? What you did, we have some more things that he did create in the final days, which I just did because I was dealing with getting rid of glitches and things like that. I was not able to get into the game in time. But do you want to mention a little bit more of what you did, guys? Um, yeah, so mostly I've been working on level related stuff because that was for me a big part um, in connecting the game that we've made to the theme and everything. Uh, Problem the oh and and the audio as well uh, yeah it's, it's, that's right I did like the audio code and the audio files that we had um, not all of them went into the game either because I did some inaudible on target hardware like on my on my PC they were audible but on my television they were just inaudible because they were too low and stuff like that so due to the time limitations we didn't have a lot of time for iteration between attempts and creation. That was a little bit unfortunate, but yeah, yeah. I did a lot of I did a lot of level actually. I think about twenty five percent of what I did actually went into the game, which was mostly because I rely extreme heavily on vertex colors, and we found out extremely late that neither my nor Wade's uh, converter or exporter would actually work correctly as we expected them to. 
Yeah, we were having some issue with vertex colors, and unfortunately, since we didn't get the models until the final days, weren't able to spend the time to fix out, figure out what it was. I my my exporter did work with vertex colors if the um, polygons were um, like if if all if it was a single flat shaded essentially um, polygon. Um, we're, but Geist used vertex colors to do really great shading, and it looked beautiful. But we were having issues with the exporters trying to get it to work quite right um, in engine. Um, now I've fixed it, so it does work now, but too little too late. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens. Awesome. Uh, I forgot to mention to the judges, the, uh, uh, Geist and Wade worked on a test third person demo. Uh, my second question is, uh, how did you take the theme and incorporate it into your entry? So um, the original plan for the theme was, um, so the the actual game is is essentially going to be, which is one I'm still going to continue to work on because it was something I've been planning for a while and it did work with the theme, which is you're you're a robot that can switch into different bodies. So there is going to be a smaller form of the robot that you could get into to go into different forms. It'd be a larger form um, that you could also basically you you would hack into these different devices or different robots and be able to control it. So that that was going to be the original theme. We did not get to the point because of uh, lack of availability, um, did not get to that point. Um, but that's what the theme was. The other thing was, other aspect that I added to it because of the theme was that the different enemies were going to have different sizes and you get different rewards depending on the size of it. And um, you'd be able to use that to upgrade your character. And so that's what the, the basic themes were. And the, the plan was to have um, at least three varieties of enemies and um, three different states for the player character to be in. Um, but time restraints rec made that not possible, unfortunately. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, do any of the judges have any questions? I mean, I, I guess just wondering what your influences were for the, the, the style of it. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a, sh a shame you're kind of you're constrained by availability and stuff. And, and certainly one thing about it was I, I just felt it was a you know, a really nice little test bed. You know, and clearly, you know, it would be great if you could build it out a bit further. Um, exactly. The, 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 I, I, I love the robot. The robot really spoke to me of kind of old F64 characters, and I was getting a bit of Gen 4 mm -hmm. and I and other things. And, um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, what? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what were your influences, I guess? So the influence for, I'd say the influence was, there's a mix of different things. The, the primary influence was the fact that we did not get a Metroid on N64, and I find that as a personal slight to me. And so Metroid was definitely a big influence. That's also Jet Force Gemini. It's one of the closest, probably one of the closest things we got on the system. Um, and that, that, that's always been a big influence on me. The, I've, I've loved that game. I love the way it plays. Um, I wanted it to control differently, so I wasn't a huge fan of the controls of that game. But other than that, um, it was I'm a huge fan of it. Um, the other influence, which came in a little bit later, was kind of a Monster Hunter vibe, where where you get, like I said, the rewards, and you, or you essentially when you defeat creatures, you get loot or you get um, different drops from them that you can use to sell and to upgrade your character. Um, so. I'd say those are three of the main influences that went into it. Um, the atmosphere-wise, definitely, definitely on the Metroid and Jet Force Gemini, uh, I would say. Yeah. Um, additionally, I would like to mention that in terms of influence, where how I went over designing the levels, which sadly isn't actually anything to be seen in the final product, because, well, the product did not actually make it over the finish line. It just crashed somewhere third of uh, the way but um so i had a lot of inspiration from old studio ghibli movies like uh, laputa's castle in the sky and nausicaa from the valley of the winds where you have that very old ancient long dead um, monolithic structures that really speak of a completely different civilization and the way of thinking way of designing and that was for me, important because I wanted to, rather than only have the literal interpretation of the theme due to small and bigger robots, I also wanted to have like a metaphorical interpretation of the theme in the contrast between 
the small consciousness and like a bigger, much more vast, expansive universe and alternative views as represented in the architecture and the murals that I had planned for the levels for the ruins of like the civilization that built the uh, the area that is to be explored. Um, I also had an idea for the strong contrast between the ruins that you walk through and like the default size of the robot where you would have this ginormously void um, dead spaces that are just like you know Egyptian ruins or Mayan ruins in space but in a cave system and then you would have interlinking little pockets of ruins with even smaller like crevices between the monolithic stones and boulders and within there would have been a more action-oriented um, play passages where you have micro um, biospheres uh, that were more akin to bioluminescent like fungus forests but uh, yeah none of that actually got in yeah or yeah we we had a lot of because like i said before we do i've already continued working on it i've already got the majority of guys stuff into the game now at this point um and once i get all of it in there i'm gonna share an update um so hopefully we'll be able to continue with it because um it's something i've been planning to work on for a while I'd come up with the framework for it and the concept of it a while back. Um, and there's just kind of a kick in the pants to get it started, um, since it worked out pretty closely with the theme that we were already, that, that the jam already had. And a lot of those things that Geist, Geist mentioned were like, these will be perfect. Uh, it'll be great to work with it. And we had all that plan and we're building out the systems, knowing full well that we will continue it after the jam. So the way that the thing is set up, it's it, everything's set up in structs. It's all uh, that we I can very easily add new assets to it, um, build it out, got it so that depending and um, ideally having the entire world be completely interlinked. So like as you walk through the current areas. Um, depending on your current location, um, different parts of the level load in, different parts of the collision load in, load out, so that hopefully it'll be it'll be possible to traverse. We, we can very easily add in new traversals without having to worry about oh, I have to do a new load zone here. I have to do, create a new level here. It's all one inter interconnected world. So, yeah, I sure hope you guys flesh out the the rest of the title because I like what I saw. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm really, really pleased to hear that something you're going to take further because it, it, it looks like a really strong foundation. So, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I was going to say I would hope you carry on with it, but um, glad to hear you are. It sounds a very ambitious project for a two-month jam, even even if you had all your free time available. <laughs> if if everything went perfectly according to plan, I think we would have been able to do it because it was only going to be a few rooms and a few enemies and stuff. But nothing ever goes according to plan, right? unless even even when it is your day in day out job, nothing ever does. Yeah. No. <laughs> the plan really was. Really was solid tool chain. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alan. Oh, sorry. Having a solid tool chain um, helps so much, with, especially if you think there's something going wrong, but you're not sure where it's gone. And then you find it towards the end. It's like, oh, nothing's actually been working properly because this tool's not doing what I thought it was. Exactly. We, I feel we've all been there. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, yeah that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. The plan. The plan really was. Um, to have a vertical slice demo, right? Like we say in industry, not to have the full game, but to have a representable part that just shows each of the features in a at least advanced beta status, where you can say, "Oh, here's like a mural that you can scan and you can read," and the game is supposed to have that in every other room. And you know, here's a passage where you are the small robot you fight, and that is the idea for the basic interconnection of the bigger spaces. So just so, so you can have an example for everything that would be supposed in a full-scale game. Yep. Yeah, so we'll continue that, continue that vertical slice. And um, I've been working, uh, well, we both have been working on various NC4-related things for a while. So it's a, it, we, 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 we know basically the platform, but there are still, building out the tool sets from scratch re requires it 
you think you might think you know how something works because it worked before until you apply it to a new thing that's slightly different and like oh well this doesn't work quite the way that i expected it to like trying to get the um you know just trying to so for for like i'll just give an example for like the textures to get max precision with it i had been um multiplying the st coordinates by the size of the texture which gave me really good precision which clashed with the way geist was modeling because he was modeling with um with uh basically using using one wall to any looping the texture what like 20 30 times possibly sometimes and so it was coming up with weird glitches on console and at first i didn't know what was causing it until i realized oh that's what it was so i had to do for workaround which was scale the texture down on export to 32 um, by 32 instead of 64 by 64 and then bit shifting it um when it's actually on in engine so just trying to find all the workarounds to with the tool sets that actually exist, which you don't know about until you try something and it does not work. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? All right. Thank you so much for being here and for participating in our jam. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it was fun. No problem. Thanks. Cheers. 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 Uh, yeah, that wraps everything up. Uh, now we just need to finish off all the scoring and put it in the sheet and announce the winner. Thank you, everyone, for coming here and helping us out. Uh, thanks for hosting. This game jam has been great. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, I love looking through the, the, the games, and, and it, it really brought home to me. I mean, yeah, I, I do some teaching and stuff, and I see the students game jamming all the time, and it's it just really brought home to me how much of the heavy lifting is done by the modern engines for them. You know, it's like you know these guys are all starting out with with virtually nothing, and and, and even getting anything to appear on the screen is 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 a big a big win. So um, yeah, really 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 good. I, I quite like the fact it was over two months as well. Because a lot of these game jams, you see people going, oh, I'm doing a game jam this weekend. And you think, <laughs> we don't want a weekend jam. We want time. And, and the time is given. Some of the games have turned out really nice just because they have the time to do something good. Yeah. Uh, in this case, it's because most people here aren't actual, like, um, the, no, no one makes a living off of making N64 games in 2020. I'm sure eventually someone mm -hmm. will find a way to do that. But uh, because most people have jobs and things to work on, uh, we felt, it, especially because this is also a very difficult system and we wanted to bring in new people, uh, two, uh, two days is not enough to make something working on this. Uh, so two months, it's I think, was a nice enough. compromise. It's normally not enough for modern engines and things, but we still do it. Yeah, I mean, Uni like you said, Unity, lever like, um, Unity leverages a lot of things. You don't really need to worry about memory management, for instance. Unity is, you can very quickly prototype a game in it. Uh, that you really won't be able to do on the N64. Although this, this game jam has made me think, oh, maybe maybe I should have a, have a go on the uh, N64 again. Because I've not got enough time to do anything else. I'm still thinking, oh, maybe I should. But <laughs> well, I'll probably try and resist that. <laughs> I think the trick would be to release N64 titles as non-fungible tokens on the crypto art market. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you guys want to participate in the dust off the old uh, programming manuals uh, for next time that we do a game jam, that'd be awesome. And plus, we're always around, so just bug us whenever you want. This community is super nice and tight, so. I was horrible at programming then, so I don't think I'm any better now, but. <laughs> oh, um, I, because I'm, I'm actually working on uh, improving tooling for us, because um, uh, Al Alan's work on the sound tools is great. The sound tools work nicely. The issue is that no one owns the cartridge for it. So to play back music is very difficult. Uh, our music workflow well, is great. Somebody mentioned Lib, Lib Micmod, right? Like Lib Micmod is now ported. Yeah, uh, there's an open source library called LibDragon, 
that uses Libnic mod. Um, but most people here work with the official SDK since that uh, has full 3D. Oh, right. I see. Okay. Uh, I do intend on making some sort of... Um, not necessarily tracker playback, but at least getting an easy way of getting tracker-like music playing on the N64, even if that includes some intermediary format. Yeah, after, after working on the new Tetris, I worked with a developer, Ian Luck, to develop a tool that converted XM and tracker formats to MIDI pattern data with a bunch of switches and things that allow you to kind of take a lot of control over how it renders the MIDI data. And it worked pretty effectively. I ended up using that for Racing Gears Advanced to be able to still sort of model how I wanted the voicing to work tightly in a tracker. And then I would basically export out the data, import it into, I don't even remember what MIDI editor I used at the time just to kind of like check it off, but I didn't have to sequence in a patched together MIDI sound font kind of thing. But that just had a lot to do with my X demo scene tracker workflow. So I think if you're super used to working with MIDI sequencers and things like that, um, it's perfectly fine to work that way. I just, for me, it came down to trackers gave you a really clear way to see exactly how your voice allocation was working because of the fact that it was on a grid and kind of a really tight way to program. But, um, you know, anyway, yeah, I don't know if that tool's still out there, but it, it in hindsight, probably would have been a much better thing for us to do in the first go rather than write what we did, which was we actually worked with Eugene Paul Mickers and another developer to kind of make an intermediary data stream format and then hacked it into the uh, sound effect play, playback buffer thing. And, you know, it was all kind of like a house of cards to get it to work, but it worked. It's in interesting you say that nobody has the cartridge for the uh, official sound tools. Because Nintendo wanted the cartridge as a, almost a sort of copy protection because the software was no use without the cartridge. And uh, so, yeah, they, they, they were thinking of that at the time. Yeah, we've been, uh, it's not very fun to use the, the program without the cartridge. That's for sure. No. Um, I have no, been. Go on, go on. I would just say it's a lot of effort initially to get the the playback would play back through the N64 through the cartridge and stuff. And that, that was a nightmare to get going. I don't remember the details. I just remember it being really hard. Yeah, it's a bit Because it basically gave us a cartridge and said, you can plug this into your PC and into the N64 and you can send data. So we had, had to write a special ROM that would be uploaded to the cartridge, which would then run and listen to certain places and you'd send the data through there to then be played on the on the ROM that was in the cartridge. Yeah, that's sort of the approach I might be also taking in the future. Uh, I'm writing this, uh, so there's like three main developer flashcards for the N64 and uh, for N64 homebrew nowadays, and they all work completely different from one another, which is incredibly annoying for developers. So I've been working on a library that um, pretty much just kind of hides away what flashcard is connected. And you can just simply do USB reading and writing on any flashcard. And the idea was I also get that working for the sound tools, even if that requires reverse engineering the original program and uh, listening in on those um, on uh, the messages that get sent to the cartridge. Uh, if it, if it helps, and what I remember, which is as obviously a long time ago, the, um, the ROM in the cartridge, which was sent over, so it was sent over from the PC and then started executing on the PC. And it just listened to the ports, and I think it was just sending off and on. So it sent switch note on, switch note off, and then send over as well. It would send off packets of actual sound data, so the waveforms and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, the ROM itself is quite small and is just sitting, listening, and listening to note on, note offs. Yeah, that's sort of the approach I was going to take with it as well. Um, yeah. I have a video here that's showing me typing something into my command prompt and changing the texture that's being displayed on the screen in real time. 
sort of what I want oh, to nice. do go with audio. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good uh, luck. Yeah, thank you. This community has grown quite a lot in four years. I remember when I first uh, joined here about three years ago, we barely had any homebrew to, to work off. And seeing this game jam and now 14 entries, it's incredible. This thing has really grown and I'm really happy at how this has turned out. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I remember playing through like a lot of the homebrew jam are homebrew games, like your uh, Pioro port, you did a really good job of Boo. And like, there wasn't that many, but now it's probably almost doubled ever since this one game jam. Yeah, we had a user who, po who made a graph showing the amount of homebrew that's been released over the years. And there's like, um, there were a bunch of homebrew released in the year 2000-ish when Dextros was still around and um, the guys who made the, um, the Bung Doctor 64. Uh, that was how demo sceners used to make homebrew for the system. Uh, and then ever since then, it's been almost no homebrew. And then with our jam, it just suddenly spikes really high. So it's awesome. I wonder if there's been, like, interest has been peaked by the Mario 64 PC port and people say, seeing that people are still using it and remembering the game a bit nostalgic. Oh, I can get into this. Oh, yeah, definitely. That Mario 64 thing brought in a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Like, even, like, on my YouTube account, like, right when Super Mario 3D All-Stars got announced, it was just so much more traffic because so much more people were wanting to look at Nintendo 64 content again, and so many people were that much more into the system. Thank you, everyone. I have to go punch in my numbers in the scorecards because I've been very late on that, but I've already played through everything. Uh, and I'll keep everyone updated on what's going on with the rest of the jam. Thanks for hosting. This was such an awesome experience. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's been, it's been a lot of fun and, and, and great to catch up with some people. So, brilliant. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. I'll get on my uh, story for the next video, so. Yeah, thanks, Sean. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.